Welcome back to the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This is Chapter 4, The Moral Imperative of Schooling. Systemic hidden curriculum change is a moral imperative. By titling two of his books using the phrase moral imperative, one of the more prolific authors on the topic of school principalship and a globally recognized leader in systemic change efforts, Michael Fullen implicitly asserts that the education of children involves a moral imperative. Unfortunately, Fullen did not bother to define what he meant by the moral imperative. His ideas about the role of the principle in systemic change are good, but because there can be some confusion about it, his books would have been much more satisfying if he had been clear about what he meant by the phrase moral imperative. Sometimes, morality gets conflated with religion. Strictly speaking, morality has nothing to do with religion, even though religions may claim to dictate morals. Consequently, some religious folks believe that their religion is the source of their morality. Scientists who study morality find that the logical implication that humans could have been amoral beings before religion came into existence is implausible. Another confusion about morality is the idea that it boils down to following rules. This is also not the case, according to numerous scholars. My view of morality relies primarily on the works of George Lakoff, Mark Johnson, and Owen Flanagan, though I believe that the views of Jonathan Haidt, Michael Sandel, Sam Harris, and Joshua Green are probably also consistent with it. Human morality starts with ourselves as an individual within family groups, and extends our concern from there into the larger contexts of other organizations and society. Morality is an evolved sensibility that is a logical extension of our drive to survive and reproduce. Morality is ultimately about well-being. We engage in moral consideration by imaginatively thinking through our understanding of a situation to arrive at a course of action that will best ensure the well-being of those whom we care about. One of the key features of moral maturity entails expanding our circle of care. As a social species with hypersocial brains, we have the capacity to extend our caring not just to organizations and society, but to other species, and potentially the planet as a whole. This view of morality is derived from a combination of scientific research and deep philosophical consideration of how to interpret the relevant scientific facts. With a clearer understanding of the moral imperative for educating children, we should be able to make better decisions about which strategies are ultimately better for effective schooling. In order to get clear about the moral imperative, imagine rescuing a child from imminent physical peril. It is not hard to see that reasonable people would naturally provide water to a child they found dehydrating in the desert, feed a starving child they found on the street, or clothe and shelter a naked child they found being exposed to the elements in a snowstorm. Even though, as educators, our moral imperatives do not usually involve death, we do owe it to our students to get clear about what our basic moral obligations are and how to respond appropriately. When moral imperatives are involved, we need to reflect carefully on what constitutes a reasonable response whenever possible. This is particularly important when we are embedded in a global culture that has normalized insensitivity to subtle forms of psychological distress in ourselves and the children we care for. In order to figure out what the moral imperative in education is, 
Let's think through two experiments. We will start with a scientific experiment and then consider a thought experiment. The science experiment is about how people recover from negative events. The experiment involved hooking folks up to a brain scanner, playing a tone, then after a 10 second delay, causing the subject to experience a painful but harmless stimulus. There were two kinds of subjects for the study. Non-meditators, who had no training in meditation, and long-term meditators, people who had been trained in and practiced meditation for years. The results of the study are summarized in the graph on page 21 in the negative association diagram. The horizontal axis is labeled time, the vertical axis is labeled activation level. There are three symbols. A speaker icon indicates a sound or a cue. An exclamation point inside a triangle indicates the pain stimulus or an event. And there is a gray line pattern that indicates the area of difference where the two paths diverge from each other. The two lines begin and end in the same places on the vertical axis. The gray solid line labeled A indicates the brain activation for the pain area in non-meditators, while the black dotted line labeled B indicates activation in the same area for the meditators. Of course, they both start out on the same level with some degree of equanimity. Then the tone sounds, and the brain activation patterns start to deviate from each other. The meditators stay at their baseline equanimity, while the non-meditators have an anticipatory activation response that increases steadily over the course of the 10 second delay. They are expressing an expectation that they will soon be experiencing pain. Then, when the pain stimulus actually occurs, the meditators join the non-meditators in experiencing pain. In fact, they might experience it just a little bit more intensely. After the stimulus is done, the meditators recover to their baseline pretty rapidly, with the resulting arc nearly symmetrical. The non-meditators, on the other hand, have their pain center still going for a while longer. The arc of the non-meditators shows a rapid rise in activation in the 10 seconds preceding the stimulus and a long, slow descent afterwards. After sufficient time has passed, both meditators and non-meditators return to baseline equanimity. Notice that they begin and end in the same place, but they have had different journeys during this time. Now, Let's think about what this means for education. An educated person is someone who perceives accurately, thinks clearly, and acts effectively on self-selected goals and aspirations that are relevant to their situation as they may non-consciously maintain mental maps of reality and how it works, without necessarily being aware that any of those things are going on. In this case, we are going to think of not just a singular pain event, but about any adverse life events that may occur. When an adverse life event occurs, then we want to know whether they are perceiving accurately and thinking clearly. When we look at how people respond to the painful stimulus, we can see that there's an area between the two curves that represents the difference between negative sensations of pain and negative thoughts that anticipate or linger on that painful experience. Those thoughts make the experience longer lasting than it needs to be. Therefore, the thoughts are unnecessarily negative. What we know in psychology is that negativity can adversely affect perception and thinking. We know 
that negative thoughts are necessary in negative situations, but that does not mean that we should dwell on those negative possibilities. Dwelling too long means that we are not handling reality as it is, and so we are creating experiences that are disconnected from reality. Being educated means having a better grasp of reality. Therefore, being educated necessarily means minimizing our production of unnecessary mental negativity because that weakens our grasp on reality. We can distinguish an educated person from a non-educated person by looking at how they handle adverse life events. An educated person goes through the negativity just like the non-educated person. But the educated person recovers more quickly and may retain a better grasp of reality throughout whatever experiences they happen to have. Coming back to the moral imperative, being an educator means taking on the moral responsibility for ensuring that the life journey of each of our students is less negative than it otherwise could have been. We, as educators, are responsible for ensuring that our students, through the experiences we co-create with them, have a better grasp of reality for having been with us. Negative experiences are inevitable, but how we experience them is not, as the experiment demonstrated. Our job as educators is to enable our students to use their psychological powers to maintain a solid grasp on reality and thus maximize their flourishing. That begs the question of what psychological powers we have that can assist us in accomplishing that task. There are four of them, though I will only give a brief description of them here. For a more complete explanation, see my book, Schooling for Holistic Equity, Chapter 16, Mimetic Leadership, Game-Changing Superpowers. First, we must tame the monkey mind, as the meditators might call it. Monkey mind is the persistent internal chatter that sometimes dwells too long on past or future possibilities. Second, we must train the elephant spirit, which draws on a metaphor made popular in psychology by Jonathan Haidt about how we have two minds. The conscious mind is a rider on the elephant of the unconscious mind. This metaphor illustrates how powerful the unconscious mind is at determining our immediate behavior. The meditators have the advantage because they've cultivated a productive relationship between their monkey mind and elephant spirit. To put it another way, the taming of the monkey mind and the training of the elephant spirit are means of affecting how our personalities and dispositions drive our behavior. Third, we can change the situation we are in. And fourth, we can choose a different situation to be in. These last two psychological powers are based on many years of counterintuitive psychological research findings, that our situations are far more powerful than the personalities and dispositions that we each bring into those situations. The truth is that the most powerful tools are choosing and shaping situations. This means that while working on the monkey mind and the elephant spirit are important aspects of education, it is more important to cultivate situational powers if we want children to become effective citizens, productive workers, and or fulfilled souls. If this is what education is all about, you might be wondering how academic subjects fit in. Let's go back to the definition of an educated person. You will recall that an educated person perceives accurately, thinks clearly, and acts effectively on self-selected goals and aspirations that are appropriate to their situation as they maintain mental maps of reality, 
without being consciously aware that those things are happening. Understanding academic subjects is the most helpful for thinking clearly. The academic disciplines are implicitly designed to train the monkey mind through shaping certain types of situations. But that leaves out some of the elements that are necessary to being educated. Academics today are necessary, but not sufficient for achieving the best possible grasp of reality. In order to do right by students, educationally and morally, educators must transcend academics. But for most people, that is a hard thing to wrap their minds around. For instance, parents are reluctant to deviate from the norm when they are trying, on behalf of their most beloved child, to make the life-changing decision of which school to attend. Policymakers and non-parents will also tend to reinforce the usual path if they see themselves as taking responsibility for all the children in their organization or society. People who take an interest in schooling on behalf of children are responding to a powerful moral imperative, but they are also embedded in a powerful global situation of cultural acceptance of a toxic grammar of schooling and age segregation, also known as age grading, as a normal practice. All parents and policymakers believe, with the best of intentions, that they are taking noble steps towards ensuring the long-term well-being of the children, even when they are wrong about the well-being consequences of accepting mainstream options. They default to perpetuating a system centered on academics, which is known to produce a journey that is psychologically harmful to most of the people on it, and does not produce educational outcomes as reliably as it could. Unfortunately, those parents and policy makers are not the ones who will get burned by their actions, which means they cannot learn directly from the consequences. When you consider the moral imperative in education today, I suggest that ultimately it is about creating a culture, a hidden curriculum, that enables our students to get a more solid grasp of reality, so that they can flourish in whatever situations life puts them into, or hopefully, that they choose for themselves. In the holistic schooling context in which I have been an educator, it is not uncommon to devalue the role of academic subjects in favor of other factors. Holistic schools commonly recognize that education consists of far more than academic growth. This casual devaluing of academics, contrary to the dominant global mainstream culture of schooling, might be the reason that holistic schools are marginal players in the overall K-12 schooling industry. But there's also no credible evidence that devaluing academics in favor of richer conceptions of learning, teaching, and schooling have any negative effects. Those conceptions are discussed in Chapter 8. In my view, holistic schools have recognized that the children and teachers in their schools must sail against the winds of ignorance in order to achieve the goal of becoming educated, even if they don't say it that way. It is time that the people in the mainstream of schools also recognize that they cannot achieve their goals unless they manage for engagement, not just for academic growth. Education, properly understood, does not allow for ignorance to be confronted directly. As a culture, we are not generally accustomed to pursuing things indirectly, so let me illustrate. Walter's Wiggles is a series of 21 steep switchbacks that rise 250 feet on the hike to Angel's Landing in Zion National Park in the state of Utah in the southwestern United States. Imagine if the top of Walter's Wiggles, illustrated on page 23, is to the north, and you have to walk back and forth along the switchbacks in the trail, which happen to alternate between sections that make you face roughly east and west. On the hill, you use switchbacks to make the climb easier. This example gives a hint at the challenge, but to fully appreciate the complexity of it, we shall consider a sailboat maneuver called tacking. In a sailboat, you use tacking to travel against the wind 
to sail to places that would otherwise be even more difficult to reach. The wind is blowing against us from the north to the south. We are sailing in a boat that has fore and aft rigging, meaning the sails are designed for the express purpose of sailing against the wind, though it can only do so with the sails in a very specific configuration. I am including two diagrams on page 24 about how tacking works on a sailboat to help you see what I mean. The closest to true north we could possibly sail is 30 degrees to the east or west. This means that attaining our goal will require us to tack. That means turning the boat back and forth in order to actually travel in the general direction of our destination, similar to walking up Walter's Wiggles in Zion. If I am the captain of our boat, and I refuse, due to cultural influences for instance, to set the sails in the appropriate way, or refuse to use tacking maneuvers, then we are not going to reach our intended destination. Ignorance is a constant headwind in education, and we have discovered that humans are all fore and aft rigged vessels on this journey. Shallow learning takes us downwind, not up against the wind of ignorance. Deeper learning requires the support of psychological needs. The cultural resistance of mainstream schooling to systematically supporting psychological needs results in shallower rather than deeper learning. When we are committed to deeper learning, this means that accepting the thwarting and or neglect of the needs of students and teachers is counterproductive at the very least, but is also a morally reprehensible way to treat people we care about. The folks involved in the mainstream of schools need to learn to set their sails in different ways. The bizarre right-wing backlash against social-emotional learning, SEL, here in the USA, suggests that there may be good political reasons to maintain the rhetorical stance that academics are the central goal of schooling. However, it is also problematic to take that stance so seriously that you undermine the deeper learning processes that are required to achieve the ultimate goal of educating children. Professional educators are most likely to succeed when they understand that academic instruction can only lead to learning deeply, when motivations are autonomous and engagement is agentic, not just behavioral. Let's make sure that our rhetoric about academics does not interfere with our ability to focus on supporting the whole child to learn deeply from all their experiences in school. Appropriate support of the whole child will lead to deeper learning of academics as well as improved mental health. As I said before, any educational goal that you have must be subservient to the psychological principles that have been revealed by self-determination theory. Applying this effectively in long-established mainstream schools requires us to pull on the levers of cultural change, including both organizational and policy leadership. This concludes the fourth episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. If you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it will take to transform education systems around the globe, check out my other website, Holistic equity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention.